And we are live. Marcus Conti reporting with my friend, Nick Brana. Nick Brana. He definitely looks familiar. How you doing, Nick? How you doing, Nick? How you doing? Are you, hey, like, Marcus. You got, you got, if you, if you, if it doesn't work out in politics, you can use your name in the, in the Sopranos. Hey, Nick Brana. Nick. Oh, like, that's, that's good. It that's sounds good. like a, Nick, it sounds like a, like a, like an Italian name. So Nick Brana, who's Nick Brana? It's actually, uh, Chilean. It's Brana, technically. Brana. I gotcha. I that's gotcha. right. So if you don't know who Nick is, if you weren't paying attention in 2016, if you were sleeping through 2016 and you don't know who Nick is, I'm going to tell you who he is. Nick Brana is the founder and national director of the Movement for a People's Party, formerly Draft Bernie for a People's Party. He was the national political outreach coordinator on the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign through the 2016 Democratic National Convention and went on to be a founding member of Our Revolution. He previously was Deputy Director of Voter Protection on the Terry McAuliffe gubernatorial campaign in Virginia. We're going to give you a pass on that one, but continue. Yeah, I know. He, he, got, Nick, his, but... he, got, <laughs> he got his BA and Environmental Policy from the College of William and Mary. Wow. So, so, so Nick is a big guy. Nick was, was instrumental in the Bernie Sanders um, campaign. He was... One of the, uh, I guess, you know, the Confederates inside of the, the bowels of the DNC with, uh, with Bernie. So I guess, I guess the, the question I want to ask you, does it, does it, does it frustrate you, Nick, that uh, Bernie Sanders is running for president again uh, on the Democratic ticket? Yeah, I think he missed a big opportunity to run as an independent. Uh, and also, uh, even more importantly, to create uh, an independent party uh, after 2016. Uh, I don't think that that window has closed. You know, he could still do it. He could certainly still do it after 2020. And in fact, I think that uh, the, that working people in general could do it uh, could do it even without him. And I think he would follow in that case. It does. I mean, my real question is: Does it make your blood boil that he had that opportunity in 2016? If we roll the tape back, there we were, 2016. We're at the we're at the convention. People are pumped. There's 40 million people strong. Yeah. You know what? What did it feel like when he when he came out in front of the cameras and said, uh, "We have to uh, we have to beat Trump and elect uh, Hillary Clinton and and Tim Kaine." How did that feel? It was uh, you know I knew it was coming, uh, but but I was also there in the convention room with all the delegates, uh, and I felt how. You know, it was devastating um, uh, because it was such an opening. You know, Bernie took us to such an uh, such like a revolutionary kind of like climax and moment, um, and and then for that to be you know to put that back into the DNC, I think it was a big mistake uh, to to say that you know we're going to endorse the embodiment of everything that we opposed. Uh, I think it was a big mistake, and I think the fact that you know. Trump won, despite having done that, is the greatest evidence of that. Yeah. I mean, it really was. I mean, it was a, it was a in my view, it was, I was a spectator, but it was a, it was a campaign of, of, uh, of passion. Uh, it was definitely together. It was 40 million strong. It was, it was a, a loud voice. And, um, you know, and now for, for that, Bernie, I'll just read off the smears and we'll see if we can... We'll get into, we'll get into other stuff, but I want to get I want to get past Bernie Sanders, right? Because he's running again, he is running again, and I don't know if you if you agree, but uh, he he can win, right? I think he can win. I mean, we'll talk about the corruption all, but right now Bernie Sanders is still a Bernie bro. He's uh, this is this is how he's perceived. The, the, my my investigative journalism has led me to to the sellout. He sold out. He bent the knee to Hillary Clinton. He's a communist. He's a socialist. He owns three houses. That means he's a millionaire, so he's, he's, you know, he can't be for the people if he owns three houses. His wife uh, is involved in bank fraud. He honeymooned in Russia. He wants to give everybody free stuff. Uh, he's going to raise your taxes. He's, he's for open borders. He's going to grab your gun. Russians, the Russians did it. The Russians hacked the election. You think the Russians hacked the election, Nick? No, I think that's always been a cover for the DNC's failure uh, and for their own election rigging. 
What, what do you think about? What do you think about? I'm I'm sorry to cut you off. What do you think about the Seth Rich? I jump right in on you. What do you think about the Seth Rich part of the DNC leak? Do you think it was that? Who, who gave? Who I gave don't, I don't know as much about that, yeah. uh, but I do think that uh, the Clinton campaign. I know that. I mean, this is just reviewing the hit, the timeline. Um, the entire Russia collusion narrative. Em- emanated it started with the clinton campaign they initiated it and the obama administration and the intelligence agencies they all jumped on board afterwards and they're doing uh the entire democratic party and who you know a disservice by sticking to that uh by beating that dead horse you know essentially instead of running on issues for two That's years two and a half years they 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 per- perpetrated a lie for two and a half years, we heard Russia, Russia, Russia did it. Yeah. When we all knew it was Robbie Mook, it was John Podesta, Hillary Clinton. They exactly. came up. With, they came up with the idea. They said, "Okay, uh, we got caught cheating." What what the public now sees in these WikiLeaks emails is devastating. Now let's blame it on Russia. And then when Hillary Clinton cheated and and took the nomination from Bernie Sanders, they then dumped the Russia story on Trump. Correct. Is that right. is that a fair yeah, assessment? They've, they've spent the past two and a half years, you know, three years now, blaming uh, Russia for what they did. You know, they're the ones who rigged an American election. And when it came to Russia, it was also, you know, like people like Aaron Matei and Glenn Greenwald have reported so well. You know, it's all smoke and mirrors. You know, it was a, it's, it's such a diversion. Whereas when it comes to DNC rigging, it was like it was this open and shut case. There's documents. There's co- there's admission of guilt. There's confession. You know, it's like it's just it's ludicrous. You know, yeah, yeah. and people believe it. I mean, you know, this you got Rachel Maddow just going for two years, going full throat, Russia, 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 and uh, I mean, right. it is embarrassing. Are oh, the elections uh, so so 2016? The elections were rigged. Uh, yeah, of course, we've corrected the problem, right? The, the election elections are fair and 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 and. Uh, Equitable now, right? The primary's fair and free. Yeah, <laughs> anything but. They got together in August 2018 in the DNC summer meeting, and they they made the rules worse than they were in 2016. Uh, awesome. Like one of the biggest things they did is they eliminated caucuses. They're so they're they're working hard to get rid of those. They've got I think they've gotten rid of about eight now. All of them. Guess what? Bernie won right. in 2016. And so, for those who don't know, the caucuses favor progressive candidates. Caucuses were the reason that Bernie was competitive in 2016, and they were even the reason that Obama defeated Hillary in 2008. You know, and so the establishment realized, hey, these caucuses are favoring progressive candidates because, you know, to come out to a caucus, it's not like, you know, you just cast a ballot, it's a day-long affair, you have to feel really passionate about the person you're there for. And so they're shutting those down, and that's going to have a huge impact. On uh, on the primary, and you know the the other way that they're doing it is that they're uh, they're they're stuffing the race with a whole bunch of people mm-hmm. to make sure that you have a contested convention. You know, you go in with a whole bunch of people holding pieces of the necessary requirement. Nobody gets to fifty percent, and that kicks it to the super delegates in the second round. And even the Bernie campaign and other campaigns, like the Buttigieg campaign, they've all admitted that they believe that that's going to happen just based on. You know the kind of the, the the level of support that each candidate has. So you're saying that you're saying that Bernie Sanders. I think we agree. Bernie Sanders did not call out the election rigging the last time. I mean, he did he did pieces of it, drips and drabs. I remember when Hillary Clinton told um, it was, they were they were uh, badgering Bernie Sanders to get his people to send money to the DNC to help down ballot candidates. And it turns mm-hmm. out that that money was being laundered back to Hillary Clinton. And yeah. him and his team and you guys, you did call it out. But he never called out the, the you know, canceling the, uh, the, the um, exit polls. There's just exit polls being off by as much as 12%. I mean, that, that's evidence of, of election rigging. That's eg- evidence of machine rigging. To, to what degree he hasn't, right. the point is he, ha- he, he hasn't, I, I, you know, he hasn't called out, he didn't call out the election rigging in the past. And now, as you said, it's being rigged again. Uh, people think it's yeah. the big steal, but it's, it's the subtle things that you're pointing out. It's, it's uh, 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 put, put 20 candidates up there and, and make them all look like jerks. 
right? And bury Bernie Sanders, the favorite, who has a 70% approval rating in the country. Bury him in a pile of shit sandwiches, for lack of a better term, and have them all talk and fight and argue and look, look stupid and weak. And, and, then, and that's one part. And then, as you say, you, you're diluting the amount of, of votes that each one can get, and nobody gets to 50. You have a contested convention, and then they go to a second, second ballot, and the superdelegates come from out of nowhere and pick the candidate. Right? And if people don't think that's going to happen, they, I mean, it's just, it's just it's so obvious that that's what we're in, uh, we're in for. Right? But, yeah. And that's if they can't screw him even before that point, you know, right. that's like their, their, their backup plan. And then even if there wasn't a second ballot, they've retained the power over the rules and bylaws committee, which sets the rules for the entire primary and has the ability to bring back the superdelegates regardless of whether there's a second ballot or force a second ballot regardless of whether it's a contested convention. And that committee in 2017, Perez, his cronies, Clinton's cronies appointed all 30 members as their loyalists. You know, there, there isn't a single Sanders member on that committee. And so they hold total power over the rules. So it's, it's, play, it's playing in a rigged game. It's like playing in a labyrinth where, you know, anytime you might see an advantage, you're closer to getting to the center, they shift the walls. Yeah, it's moving the goalposts. It's just... It's just that people don't people don't have a say in the matter, and what what causes it? I, I mean, I, I think you would agree that it's it's the money in politics, right? They're taking you know the donors the donors are running the game. They control the super delegates. They control the de, you know the the DNC, and they control the rules. Yeah. And they they just don't listen to the people. I mean, it's just, in fact, a lot of the DNC members and the super delegates uh, and the DNC members are all super delegates. Uh, there's about four hundred uh, of them, a little more. Uh, and then there's also the members of Congress are superdelegates, Democratic members of Congress, some past like presidents, Democratic presidents, uh, and kind of other special officials in the Democratic Party. Those make up the superdelegates. And a lot of them, DNC members and superdelegates, are either donors or lobbyists themselves. You know, And so uh, looking at the composition of the DNC, it's a committee of corporate lobbyists a committee of, of corporations that is coming together with the facade of democratic legitimacy to, you know, create the laws and write the rules and govern the country. And the fact that we even think that's going to produce, like, democratic outcomes, you know, is the most ludicrous part to me. Do you think they, the Democrats would rather lose with Trump this time than win with Bernie? Oh, there's no doubt about it. That was the choice they made the first time. Right. And, you know, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, there's no question about it. Because ultimately, uh, I don't see them as two, di as two parties anymore. I see them as one party. And they, you know, they work so closely in conjunction with each other. It's like two symbiotic halves of one organism. You know, the Republican Party could not continuously move us towards oligarchy without the Democratic Party's active and willing participation and help, you know, all of the time. Um, it's the same donors that give to both parties. It's the same corporations that give to both parties. They have lobbyists on both of their committees. You know, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It's just a facade. But what do you say to the what do you say to the millions of Trump supporters, people that voted for Trump because they wanted they heard a message of, you know, change. They heard change. They heard a populist rising a guy an actor you know a, a stage actor came up and he was a billionaire and he's going to help you be a billionaire and he's going to make america great again he's going to drain the swamp he's going to lock her up right? and and he and he won he just snow he snow blinded a lot of people and i mean the, the, again the the picture the picture that that you are painting and the picture that i i believe is that it is a it is a very a deeply corrupted system Corrupted by money that that the the politicians are paid off, that the the voice of the people is not heard. But how do you what do you say to the Trump people that think that they got a better deal with Trump? Well, to begin with, I think there's no greater evidence that people want a revolution in this country than the fact that they elected Trump. You know, this like vulgar reality TV show billionaire. You know, that people thought that that 
person who's artificial in every way, from you know his hair to his skin, uh, the people thought that that person was preferable to Hillary Clinton. You know, this like elder stateswoman who you know, Secretary of State, former first lady, you know, senator. That they thought you know that goes to show you how desperately people want change. Now, obviously, he's a con artist. You know, he, I mean, he, he represent, he represents the 1% or the 0.001%, basically cutting out the middlemen politicians, which they would typically buy off in the equation of control and saying, no, we're going to cut that out and we're going to become the politicians ourselves. The wealthy are going to become the politicians ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like moving from a plutocracy to a kleptocracy, you know, and that's why the minute he got into the White House, he packed his... Like, he, he put more billionaires in his cabinet, you know, than than anyone ever has before, you know? So it's like the billion, you know, just shedding the facade. I mean, Obama and Clinton before him and Jimmy Carter before him, you know, they've run this facade, the Democrats have run this facade with a prettier face for a long time of being for the people, being for working people, you know? But... Trump comes along, the biggest difference as far as I'm concerned that he's made is that he just took the mask off, and now we see the ugliness for what it is. Yeah. So, so, so help, help, help people ex- uh, understand this, right? Because I've tried to explain it 500 times, and I get uh, torn up. But if, if, you have, if you have Republicans on one side, right, and I guess in social media you can represent that I don't know if you follow the uh, like Q and and the the, the the Q boards and Antifa and all this stuff. Are you are you familiar with it a little bit? I haven't followed it very yeah. closely. So there's this this oh. phenomenon. It's Q and it's uh, it's uh, allegedly the voice of the people, uh, the voice of Trump. It's some insider who's leaking classified information down to the people. A lot of people believe it, but but the, beyond that, it represents a a deep belief that if you could drain this swamp right if you can drain the swamp and rid rid the government of corrupt uh cia fbi then everything will be fine right now we know that james Con- none of them have ever gone to jail by the way not a single one of them nobody there's been no convictions from comey to mccabe and all these these dirty players but the the, the fact is that that um t- so that's the republicans right drain the swamp Right. right, and then the other side is that we have to the the Antifa side is that it's it's because he's a racist, a misogynist, a sexist, a homophobe, blah 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 blah, blah, blah. and the long list that he's he's against immigrants, he's against this, he's against that. Okay, Trump is a vile. I'm fr- I'm from New York. Trump is a vile creature. We could argue is Trump a racist? I, I don't think so. I think he's an actor. I nobody knows what Trump is. Trump is is what you want him. You know is what is what he presents himself in the moment. So you have on one side, you have on one side the, the, the Republican idea that drained the swamp, where Trump replaced that swamp anyway with Pompeo and, and John Bolton, far worse characters than were, were there in Mnuchin, far worse characters. And on the other side, they believe that Trump is the problem because he's all of those things, Right. And all of those, in all of that equation, they step over the thing that we're talking about, which is money in politics, which is corrupt elections, fake elections, right? Uh, the, for lack of a better term, taking Bernie Sanders, the person, out of the equation, right? The progressive idea of universal single-payer health care, college tuition at city and state universities, you know, getting money out of politics, maybe break up the banks, maybe deflate the military industrial complex maybe start talking about climate change as a as a as a green new deal a way to stimulate the economy how do we how do we i know i'm rambling but how do we get people to to realize that on both sides of the political spectrum they've been snowblind they've been they've been ripped off yeah. and lied to and that whether it's whether it's sanders prevailing in the democratic party or what, what we'll talk about now is, is your idea of a new party. How do we get people to realize that, that either one of these, either choices is devastating the same and, and leads to more of the same? Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, I think you kind of brought it up. I think that there are issues that have virtually unanimous agreement in the United States today. You know, issues like who supports, you know, having a system of legalized bribery, you know, who that would consider themselves progressive, libertarian, conservative, liberal, whatever, you know, no, almost nobody supports that. I mean, there, it, there's like 93% opposition to that too, you know, similarly rigged elections, inequality, the inability to afford health insurance that affects you regardless of what your, you know, political ideology or label is, you know, so I agree there are these issues and there are these points where we come, where we can come together, you know, uh, and I think that's what we need to do, you know, uh, I think that's part that's part of what we need to do as a in, in building a people's party, you know. Uh like you said, uh in 2017, uh myself and others started the movement for a people's party and we've grown to 60,000 uh now and uh our I at the core of our foundation is that opposition to money in politics, you know, and being able to dismantle these two parties who just, you know, as a pendulum swing back and forth uh, and end up screwing us because they rep they ultimately represent a tiny fraction of one percent who have all the money. You know they send us to the wars. They they inflate the cost of our health care. You know they they kind of attach a ball and chain to myself and friends uh, in terms of our student debt. You know and that that's the kind of thing that nobody nobody supports that. You know and so we have to be able to. I think, come together around those issues that they're using, you know, to, 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 to plunder us, basically. Uh, and I think that we can do that. I think people are fed up enough to be able to do that. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I, I agree with everything you're saying, but I don't know if people are, are there yet. I think I remember Bernie Sanders saying, I could see it. I, it's where... We're almost, I almost see the signs of a political revolution, you know, and I mean, mm -hmm. it is, it is simple numbers, really. I, I think that, I think that if there's 330 million people in a country, you're seeing it in Hong Kong right now, where 30% of the country rise up and they could, they could, you know, they could stop commerce. They could, they could stop the, uh, the, the political dialogue. And I mean, if a hundred million people in America rose up, and 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 walked out a third, just a third. That's all we're asking for is a third of the people got up, walked out of work, withdrew their money from the bank, refused to participate. Not not violence. I'm not I'm not about. I don't believe in in disobedience. I say less is more. More of a Gandhi approach where you kind of just you mm. you 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 hit them in the pocket. Right? It's it's so obvious. If you stop spending uh, and you stop participating. Just for a week, you could you could uh, you can make devastating change. But I, I don't I don't I think it's I think the media in this country is very slick in, in keeping people divided, keeping people fighting over identity politics. It's race. It's 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 whatever. It's all nonsense. It's it's you know the uh, uh, the, the analogy. The, the threshold's even lower than you're saying though. Um, right. Uh, and so. A few years ago, uh, there was a uh, uh, there was a study done by uh, by Erica Chenoweth that kind of estimated what is the it looked at the past hundred years of revolutions uh, around the world, and the purpose was to identify you know what is the number at which uh, revolutions kind of you know always succeed, uh, and she found that it's a lot lower than you would think. It's just Three and a half percent of the population. When you get three and a half percent of the population, no revolution in the past hundred years has failed to to overturn a government. You know, to to create a, a, a different government. Uh, and so it's really a much lower threshold uh, than than you would think. And there's also um, it's generally believed that this is kind of you know mass. Uh, popular uprisings uh, are generally kind of treated as something that is random, unpredictable. Um, but in fact, there's a there's a kind of burgeoning social science around it with individuals like Gene Sharp and Mark and Paul Engler, 
who have studied the and Eric Chenoweth as well, you know, who've studied this, and they have found, in fact, that uh, you know there are ways to galvanize people to that kind of change, and uh, and I think that's a big part of what we need to do is nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, you know, the kind of which the power is being shown on Hong Kong. And that's an extreme example. You know, it does not take 30% of the population. You know, it takes a much smaller number. Yeah, but they are dealing with the Chinese. I mean, the Chinese are historically ruthless. I mean, they will. They, they didn't stop in Tibet and all. But, but yeah, I, I, I get you, man. The, simp- the numbers, 3.5%. So, so, um, so... So Bernie Sanders, you met you met Sanders. What do you think? What's the reason? Having, I mean, he's not a, he's not a stupid guy, right? Is Bernie Sanders stupid? Does he not know what's going on in the world? Yes or no? I mean, no, no, he no, he, he, he has. Different he's very bright. He's aware. Yeah. Right? So why didn't he? Why didn't he go for it? Is he a sellout? Is he a or? Or is, is, is he just, a, my question is, having known him, having been close to it, having been inside of it, is he just a coward and not a leader? Or he's now, he's now set the stage for the big move in 2020. What do you think? I actually think that that's up to us. Mm. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think, I think that the way you frame the question gives Bernie too much power. Actually, okay. uh, because I think if we demand that he does this and we say, Bernie, you know, we're going ahead with creating a new party because this system is killing us, you know, and we're not taking we're not tolerating it anymore. And if he is in the position of being the rear guard of saying, you know, I'm not. No, I'm going to try to hold people in the Democratic Party. I'm not going to go there. And you have, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. Uh, who are saying instead, you know, no, we're doing this, we're forming a new party, then he would come. You know, that's that's the extent to which I think Bernie, you know, plays into this. Right, let's talk about third party, right? We already have, we have Greens, we have Libertarians, you want to start a party, uh, we, we, you know, there's our revolution, there's Justice Democrats. Uh, the obstacles, I mean, the obstacles are, are obvious. If you think they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, Democrats cheat each other. Whoa, they're gonna. I mean, look what they did to Jill Stein. They put her out at one percent of the vote. She probably got six or seven percent easily, maybe ten percent, right? And they 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 chalked her up as a one percenter. Uh, so how do you how do you overcome that? I mean, they, they the Democrats and Republicans they control the governor's seats, they control the election boards, they control everything. How do you? Come well, I mean, I see it. If Bernie Sanders would have defected with forty million people, that is a different story. That is a a that is equivalent to you know the the, the Republicans overthrowing the Whigs, right? It's 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 right. it's big. But now we have another we have another story. A grassroots. I don't I don't mean to be you know playing the devil's advocate, but show, tell me how how we get a third party that that you know attracts people and can overcome that power rather than than maybe 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 you know support the senile you know bernie sanders and follow through in his idea to overthrow the democratic party and once he's in there you know cross your fingers and maybe he's maybe change will come you know i mean how do you how do you get the my point is how do you get the how do you get that third party off the ground without the without the the iconic leader in front of it yeah well like i said i think that uh i think that bernie sanders could be made uh to join you know to come along but but it would take like he says ironically it would take the people demanding it of him you know and so this is going to be the third time that the democrats steal a national election in such a brazen way uh, they did it in 2016, like we talked about. They did it in 2018, and that's less understood. Uh, but there were more than a hundred candidates who were endorsed by, you know, these various progressive groups like Our Revolution, Justice Democrats, uh, Brand New Congress uh, for Congress. More than a hundred candidates. Out of them, uh, two, only two, managed to unseat establishment Democrats and win in the general election. 
And so that goes to show you the extent, and that was not an accident. That was the DNC operating in the same way that it did in 2016 to prevent the candidates from being successful, uh, progressive candidates. In 2020, it's going to be the third time that happens. You know, in 2016, you were there, you saw there was all this momentum out of the corporate parties, out of the Democratic Party, the Dem Exit movement. Nobody was talking about Dem Enter, in, you know, during the convention in July, you know, uh, the same thing, Bernie or Bust movement. Well, when they do it again to him, that's going to happen again. But this time, if we're not caught off guard, if we're prepared to act, you know, if we've laid this groundwork, then we can break through that barrier instead. And we, we can still say, need, but we still need the leader. We still need the leader. Party. We still need the leader. Bernie Sanders failed to lead. I, you, you don't agree? You think that, of, I mean, in terms look. Of that, I, I think there are a lot of people, though. I think there are a lot, like, for example, Tulsi Gabbard, right. Jesse Ventura. I think there are a lot of people, and I think there's a potential. Okay, so, so what you're saying, okay, so, so like what you're saying well. is this. All right, so what you're saying is this. So, so the rising up, it's 2020, it's uh, November, it's, no, no, it's the summer of 2020. Bernie Sanders is clearly the favorite in America. He gets cheated. And it's the same kind of outrage. It's the same kind of split, you know, half the, half the convention walking out with, with their middle fingers up. Uh, and you're saying that if Bernie doesn't come along, screw Bernie, raise up Tulsi Gabbard or somebody, or even a Andrew Yang or somebody like well, Tulsi Gabbard. Right? So, so you're saying that, that you, could, you could replace the figurehead as long as you have the momentum? I don't think that Bernie's the only way, you know, to get a major new party. There are other leaders, you know, if you, and, and we can talk about how important it is to have kind of a figurehead like that, you know. Uh, you might think it's more important than I do, but I think you can have those individuals, even like the two that I mentioned, you know, Dennis Kucinich. You could have a lot, there's a lot of people out there who are discontent with the two-party system, who have large followings, you know, they've, uh, who I think would participate in a coalition effort if there was just an impetus to do that, you know? Uh, Jimmy Dore is another one, you know? He, <laughs> he's just fantastic. He's totally, Jimmy he's Dore already for totally on board. He's had me on a number of times, you know? So uh, in that way, I think you could put together a coalition of, it's not just them either but of a grassroots movement, you know, which will grow and which will be furious, you know, in the wake of a convention, in the wake of a rigged primary, you know, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of it's going to happen before the convention. These individuals as well who get personally cheated uh, out of it, like Tulsi Gabbard will, you know, others like Jesse Ventura, like I mentioned, so influencers like that, you know, other uh, unions as well. You know, unions have, are fed up with the Democratic Party. In 2017, there was a resolution that passed the AFL-CIO that said that labor should explore building an independent party. There are other unions that have passed similar resolutions themselves. You know, then there are, uh, I mean, looking to people like celebrities as well, you know, who are also independent. Uh, Susan Sarandon and Viggo Mortensen, they both endorsed Jill Stein. You know, they're, they're, and that's just the beginning. There's a whole bunch of, of, of different ones. So when you start talking about that, there is the potential, if there's an organized force and we're working for it, there's a potential to put all these pieces together that want something different already and to, in the wake of that, you know, enormous primary, say, fuck these two parties, we're building our own. Imagine if that had existed in 2016 when Bernie was cheated. Would we still be here? I don't think so. I think I think, I think he could have parties would be done as they exist. I don't think he would have he may not have won but man what a discussion it would have been. He would Trump may have well who knows he probably he probably could have won but it, again with the exception of the cheating the his an independent uh, party you know if he would have defected to the greens they would have cheated the greens you know but I don't know maybe I'm a pessimist maybe I'm too I I just I I I believe that the cheating is is way out of control, is, is beyond anything that, that we really want to agree. I mean, people just, they look right into the camera, Two, 200,000 voters get purged here in Brooklyn, and it's illegal, and it's a felony, and nobody bats an eye. They're just like, 
<laughs> yeah, nothing to see here, you know. And that that's 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 pretty messed up, you know. Millions were were have been purged. Right yeah. in California, what two hundred years? Two million two million votes weren't right. counted in Cali. It's crazy. But that's why. But but that's where the other things that we were talking about come in, you know. Yeah. And so. It's, it's not enough, I think, just to have kind of this electoral vehicle, you know, and to have it be kind of a party in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. You have to reinvent what a party is, you know, and so it has to be a movement and a party, you know, and so at the same time, it has to be pointing out those things about the massive electoral rigging, you know, that like we saw in Tim Canova's race, you know, mm -hmm. in addition to the 2016 race, uh, and that has the ability, once you have a movement party that is actually putting a searing spotlight onto those things, then I think it becomes untenable, you know? And at the same time, I think that combining nonviolent revolution with what's being done here, nonviolent direct action in the way that King did, in the way that Gandhi did, uh, in the way that Gene Sharp has written about, that I think is another part of, of what is going to be necessary. You know, but it is eminently doable when you're bringing those things together. So we only have 12 years left, though, because the because we're going to burn a hole in the ozone. And uh, what is it like? We're down to yeah. like a thousand species out of a million. You know, there's not going to be anything left but humans and the animals that the humans chase around to eat. I would, you know, it's we're going down. The water's polluted. The, the air is it's like a you know, it's it's Malcolm Galdwell's The Tipping Point. You know, we're almost, right. we're almost there. People think, oh, it's a long, slow degradation, but no, it's like a, it's like a balloon. It just, you can only blow it up so much and then it goes pow and it, and it, right. it inflates, you know? So, so what do we, you know, because if you say, if you say, uh, if you say uh, Green New Deal, the, 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 the half the country screams communist. No, no, no. He's a communist. Green New Deal. That's communism. That's communism. Mm -hmm. Right. You say, you say, uh, 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 health, universal health care. No, that's kind of, that's a socialist, communist, socialist. No, 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 we're capitalists, right? You know, the, the, the gaslighting. But uh, I think so, that, uh, I, I think that the majority of the country doesn't fall for that anymore. And I think a lot of it comes down to how you frame those issues. Yeah. Like, look at Bernie Sanders. I mean, he got a standing ovation at a Fox News town hall. You know, for saying, do you want to replace your employer insurance with a single payer system? Before that, in 2016, I remember one of the moments when I said, this is going to be, you know, like lightning, is when he went to, okay, he'd done tons of progressive rallies, but it's when he went to Liberty University, you know, yeah. in, here in Virginia, where I am, you know, yeah. and he gave this talk at one of the most conservative, you know, universities. And he had people there cheering for him as well. And, you know, and he communicated so well. And so, you know, like we started talking about, it's those issues about like basic survival, you know, like strip away the ideology and the labels and just talk about this in the sense of like basic survival. You know, you get no, nobody in this country can afford their health care, you know, right. because it's, it's just insane. You I know? just on the note of on the note of notoriety with uh, Sanders. I know that the media is not going to report it, but he just went on Joe Rogan ninety uh, nine hundred. Uh, I'm sorry, nine million two hundred. I just opened the page, nine wow. million two hundred thousand views for a podcast politician and a, a comic and a politician. Where does that ever happen? That's so. You're going to tell me anybody's going to who's going to say that. That Joe Biden is 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 beating Bernie Sanders by double digits. If you say that, you got to have your head examined, right? And that's more evidence of rigging. That that Emerson, that uh, that the the Economist, uh, the, that uh, you know you know them better than I do. But all these fake polls, these polling places are rigging it as well. But the fact is, just a week ago, Bernie Sanders drew nine million people to a podcast. To hear the message, and yeah. even Trump people, even even Joe Rogan said, "I'd vote for this guy. This guy I like this guy. That's amazing." When, exactly. When's when the, the message? Last time when his arms on the table like this, Bernie style. All he did was talk about policy. There was nothing. There was nothing, you know, spark about it, and uh, you know, there was no, uh, you know, he didn't rally up the crowd, and he just gave, he just stated the facts. That's it. 
He said that you're being robbed by the 1%. He made it clear. You're being robbed, and, 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 is, and the only way out of it is, to, is a financial <laughs> attack to break up the 1%, to knock it down, right? And, that's, and that was his message. And then 9 million people, you know, watching. That's, that's exciting to me when I saw that. That is exciting. Yeah. So, so what about so you got so you got some involvement with uh, climate change? Let's talk about that for a little bit. You, so, so uh, extinction. Are you a vegan, by the way? Are you vegetarian? I hope. Are you a vegetarian? Uh, I'm, I'm I'm an aspiring vegetarian. Oh, good. All right. Good. That's that's <laughs> that's better than that's better than saying I I can't give it up. I can't. I know it's it's difficult. I've been a vegan for about ten years, and um, it's it's a it's. I mean, if you care about animal rights and you care about that. I mean, vegan is is really the only option if you've ever seen the slaughter. Does it feel right. better? I always I always like to ask people. You know, do you feel better when you make this? Absolutely, switch? not like, not right away. And morally, yeah, not not right away. I'm 55 years old. Do I look 55? Do I look like an old man? I, I mean, I see Thank people you. that I went to high school with, and that are my age. I said, my God, what happened I, to you? I you thought know? you were I thought you were 35. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm 55 years old. I run I ran five miles before I even walk, before I got here. <laughs> so. So yes, I I think that there is with vegan there is a uh, there, I'm also a, I was also a clinical dietitian so I kind of know what I was doing you know, uh, but uh, the, the you feel you feel like shit for about a month, right? And you you're detoxing you detox off of the the you know and give it all up give up the sweets and the junk food the nicotine the alcohol I I don't I don't I don't drink I don't smoke I uh, vegan I think I mean you forget I guess I forget what really bad feels like like i don't know what it feels like i don't know what it feels like to be grossly overweight or or wheezing or or feeling the 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 uh not to say that meat is necessarily unhealthy but i think that um i think that the vegan i i feel better i feel lighter Mm -hmm. i feel i feel a sense I, i felt you know more clear and certainly i can i can see a cow and or a horse or or a chicken, and and look at it with with no um, n- no hard feelings or or no um, sense of like I'm contributing to that species as uh, torture. I mean, there's no greater tortured animal on the planet, you know, than a chicken. When you consider the eggs and all that stuff, right? And uh, and it, of course, there's an environmental part of it, but but the the sheer um, the, you ask me, do I feel better? In that respect, I feel reborn, you know, born again, almost. That that I am not contributing to the to the slaughtering of a trillion creatures a year for food. That it, it's not, it's senseless, you know. Look at, I mean, even even Bur- even uh, Burger King figured it out. You got the Impossible Whopper, which is really shit. I've had it, but but beyond meat, they make a sausage that is wow, is it good? Try to try to be on meat sausage. It's very good. I will. You know, and yeah, and, cut and it down I, a lot, and I, I want to like you. I want to give it up entirely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I the, the, the I could <clears> tell <throat> you the the um, the moment that I did it was, I had been watching the the slaughterhouse videos for a while. I had been watching the, you know, the pigs being slaughtered, and mm. and and it just it, it was it was just like a it was just one day, you know. It was and it was like a light switch, and I said. I can't do this anymore, you know, and that was it. And, uh, I mean, I've, I've slipped into an egg once in a while years ago, but for the most part, I, I cannot phantom eating, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the flesh of tortured animals. And I know people don't want to hear it, but it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a big deal, you know, and it has the environmental, you know, the CO2 release from the cows and all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's enormous. Yeah. But uh, that's a good thing. But so, so what do we do about the environment? I know you, you glued yourself to Congress's door. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. You guys did tell us about it. what did you do. So, uh, 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 as the movement for a People's Party, uh, we're working with a group called Extinction Rebellion. Uh-huh. Uh, they started off in the United Kingdom uh, last fall, and since then they've blown up around the world, uh, and they've come here to the United States. Uh, and what makes this group different, you know, from other climate groups and from other activist groups in general and unique is that their philosophy of change, their theory of change is entirely 
around nonviolent civil disobedience. Uh, and so in London, uh, for about three weeks in April, they just brought the city to a standstill. You know, they blocked the, the major roads, the highways, they stopped the, uh, the tube from moving, they stopped the buses, you know, and so the city was paralyzed, you know, and, uh, and as a result of that, you know, just as a sign that that, that, that activism works, that kind of nonviolent, uh, rebellion, uh, the UK government, which is a you know a, a conservative government, uh, a law, uh, they uh, passed a climate emergency, you know, and uh, the Green Party over there in the last EU elections decimated them in those elections. The two parties, the Conservative and the Liberal Party, were brought down to about twenty two percent combined, which is astonishing, you know. And this is another thing we can talk about because this is happening around the world, actually, where long entrenched establishment parties are, be, are, are being de decimated and replaced by new parties, you know, it's part of the reason that it can happen here. Right. Uh, but that essentially has come here to the United States. And so uh, we, uh, in, here in D.C. with Extinction Rebellion Movement for a People's Party, we went uh, to Congress and we super glued ourselves to the doorways leading from the House buildings over to Congress, and we blocked, physically blocked the members of Congress from getting to the vote. And wow. so, as a result of this, they had to come face to face with us and hear the fact that, you know, we've got, uh, the UN IPCC says we've got 11 years, you know, and you're over here, you know, basically wasting our fucking time uh, doing nothing about climate change, you know, and so we, uh, yeah, it was a, it was huge success. It took about 50 people to pull it off and then about a hundred more people who were there supporting us um, and uh, and that that was just the beginning uh, too because uh, on September 23rd uh, we're going to do something uh, even more audacious here and that is we're going to shut down the city like they did in London mm -hmm. we're going to block the streets we're going to block uh, the major intersections and we're going to bring the city to a standstill uh, during, in the middle of the global uh, climate strike uh, action. That's September 20th to the 27th, and we're shutting it down on the 23rd. And it's happening in, in New York, too. Oh. That's coming on the 7th, uh, October 7th. October 7th, uh, okay. I'll write yeah. that down. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and it's also, it's being done in solidarity with a whole bunch of cities. So back in April when Extinction Rebellion did this, it was... The, uh, it was just London, but since then it's, it's exploded, you know, there's, there's real, like Generation Z and Millennials are like really rebelling, and this is one of the lightning issues, you know, this is one of the issues that is just galvanizing a generation, and so now, from that start in London, of shutting down London, it's going to, on October 7th, uh, to London, Berlin, Madrid, Amsterdam, Paris, you know, and then with uh, New York uh, and with D.C., you know, kind of kicking it off on September 23rd. So, you know, this is really, uh, it, it's really a, a international explosion of, of revolt against the fact that um, our politicians and our governments are like consciously walking us towards climate mm -hmm. catastrophe without See, doing it. It's the oil companies. I mean, we know what it is. It's the oil companies will... They'll take your, you know, they'll take your rebellion and they'll, then they'll allocate a billion dollars to crush the message of, oh, it's, it's a hoax, it's China, it's the, you know, it's a, but it's, again, it's always money in politics, right? It's, it's, it's legalized bribery, as you had said earlier. The extinction, you know, someone pointed out, I did a video, I was walking around in, in, in Washington Square Park, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and there was like some kind of other rally going on and I didn't know what it was, right? And it wound up being extinction. The your extinction revolution had a sign there, and I went back and watched the video. I was like, I, I missed it because I didn't know what it was. Right? I just kind of went on to some other some other rally. But I, I have seen you guys. Uh, I have seen you guys out there, and I, you know, it's, I think it's, it's a really big New York chapter. You should connect with them. I, I will. I will definitely. Yeah, I'm. I'm into that. I mean, I, I look. I've gone to rallies. They had a rally one time on uh, the steps of um, of. Uh, city hall over here and i was there and i you know and, and my question my question to people is i say to them they say oh yeah green new deal 
We got a we got a we got a jobs for everybody. We're gonna we're gonna windmills and solar panels and and everything. <laughs> and right. And I'm not goofing on it. Of course that's of course that's the way to go. Of course, yeah. there's no doubt about it. That you and you say to yourself, great. Do you think how, how are you gonna get Exxon Mobil out of the way? How are you gonna get uh, uh, you know uh, you know BP out of the way? How are you going to get these giant oil companies? What are you going to say to them? They're going to, they're going to laugh at you. They're laughing at you now. I, so, so this is part of the reason that we've allied with them is because okay. uh, so they have three three key principles. You know, the first is that tell the truth, acknowledge the fact that we are in a climate catastrophe. Very simple. The second is net zero carbon emissions uh, by twenty twenty five. You know, which is what the science says that we need to do, and it's absolutely you know capable in a logistical way. And the third uh, is that we need a people's assembly to, to manage and oversee the transition. And so that that is one of the reasons, too, that Extinction Rebellion is so revolutionary, is because it's saying we don't even trust these institutions, you know, that exist now that are supposed to be governing us, you know, they have lost their legitimacy. You know, the government has violated, it has a social contract, you know, contract with the people to protect the people, its own people, because the people comprise the government. And the government has violated that social contract because it is so infiltrated and polluted with corporate money and corporate lobbyists, you know. And so as a result of that, we don't trust you. We need to form our own democratic institutions like a people's party, like a people's assembly, to manage that transition, and in fact, to govern society, you know? And so th that's what makes it so appealing, is that it goes to that level of analysis, you know? And the fourth principle is a just transition. Yeah, no doubt, man. You know, it's, uh, it's really good talking to you, Nick. You're, you're, a, uh, you're, a, very smart, you're a very smart young man, Nick. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I, I really do. I appreciate talking to you. It's, uh, it's uh, refreshing. And uh, so I guess my final question is if... Um, Bernie Sanders is running in, in 2020, I heard. Are you going to, uh, when you walk into the ballot box, you think you'll vote for him? You know, uh, I haven't decided what I'm going to do there. Uh, I do think that Bernie Sanders is hounds down the best uh, among the Democrats running. Uh, and that's not to say that he's perfect or that I support everything that he's done, obviously. But um, but there's there's no one else, you know, in there. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard is also fantastic. Mike Gravel was great, but he just dropped out. Uh, but there's no one else in there who believes in the necessity and power of movements to to achieve change. Right. So that's I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's really our only that's really our only hope right now. So where could people find you? The, the people's uh, movement for a people's party. Why don't you go ahead and plug it? Yeah, so come find us at uh, peoplesparty.org. Uh, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Uh, Movement for People's Parties, where you can find us. Uh, so come join. You know, come join the the revolution. Uh, and we would love to work with you. Love to uh, bring you onto the team. You know, go on a volunteer because uh, this is going to take everybody we can we can get. But like we've talked about for the past hour. This is so doable. It's just a function of us getting together and pulling it together and being ready for those moments. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I really agree. All right, Nick, Nick Brana, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, thank you, Nick. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks, just, Marcus. Yeah, it's been great. Just stay, stand by, stand by, stand by. So, uh, Marcus Conte reporting.